direction. There are variables in the environment that can alter the relative value of a particular reinforcer at a particular time. These variables are called motivating operations, or MOs. For example, if you have just gone for a run, water might be particularly valuable to you at that moment compared to other moments. At that moment, there are a set of behaviors that are more likely to occur because those behaviors have produced water in the past, like getting a glass of water or getting money out of your wallet to buy a bottled water. Motivating operations are fleeting, and that particular reinforcer, water, may only be valuable during that moment in time. When using reinforcement procedures to increase behavior, it can be very effective to use MOs to guide the selection of very potent reinforcers in a particular moment. Deprivation is when a person hasn't had access to a particular reinforcer for a significant period of time. This period of time without the particular reinforcer increases the value of that reinforcer in that particular moment. For example, if someone has been in a foreign country for a while, they might be deprived of certain foods that they normally eat in their home country, like a cheeseburger. When they return home, they might be willing to pay $100 to get their hands on a cheeseburger. Another variable of reinforcer effectiveness is called immediacy. The time between the occurrence of the behavior and the delivery of the reinforcer is critical to the effectiveness of the reinforcer. The more immediate the reinforcer, the more effective it becomes. If there's too much time between the behavior and the reinforcer, then the reinforcer loses its power. Consider a time when you told a joke. It was important for you to receive immediate feedback, such as a laugh or a snicker. Getting an immediate reaction increased the likelihood of repeating that joke in the future. If you didn't get immediate feedback, you most likely wouldn't tell that joke again. The size or magnitude of the reinforcer will also affect its strength. You would probably work really hard to get good grades if you were offered $100 for every A on a report card. You probably wouldn't sweat it if you were offered $1 for every A. When using positive reinforcement, giving <laughs> just the right size reinforcer can be tricky. You don't want to give so much that they get satiated on a reinforcer, but you want to give enough of the reinforcer so that it is valuable to them and increases the likelihood of the target behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Another variable of reinforcer effectiveness is contingency. When the reinforcer is delivered only for the target behavior, the more effective the reinforcer. For example, Josh's mom was teaching him to eat vegetables. He <coughs> got chocolate whenever he ate his vegetables and only when he ate his vegetables. He started eating more and more veggies. But one day, Josh started refusing the vegetables. Mom considered all the variables of reinforcer effectiveness. Did Josh get chocolate very often? Did she give it to him immediately after eating veggies? Was the size of the chocolate enough? Then she discovered that Josh had found the chocolate stash and was able to sneak in and get chocolate when people weren't looking. <laughs> the value of chocolate had decreased because there was no deprivation or contingency. You can remember these variables of reinforcement by remembering the word disc, deprivation, immediacy, size, and contingency. Let's and, do a few. And these are similar to the um, factors that we did talk about a couple of weeks ago when we talked about, we did talk about immediacy, contingency. Now, here there, we talked about establishing operations, which that is when we talked about deprivation and satiation, but here they just put deprivation, so it's still the same. And then for intensity of the stimulus, that's what we talked about, and that's the same thing as just basically the size of it, right? How much of the reinforcer or how little was given. The only one that is not up here that we did talk about was individual differences, and that was discussed in your book as a factor that could influence whether reinforcement you know, is going to work or not. And what do we talk about? What, what does that mean, individual differences, when it comes to 
everybody likes different things, right? You're going to be, everyone is going to be motivated for, for different um, types of reinforcement. So we want to make sure that we do a proper evaluation, we ask the right questions, um, so we know which one works for that individual. So that, that's the only one that's not up here that we did not have. Exercises to see if you can recognize when these principles are being used effectively and when they are not. Joseph was playing with his friends while his dad socialized with the neighbors. One time he walked over to his dad and asked him a question. His dad answered quickly and told him to go back and play. He noticed that Joseph was sharing very nicely with his friends. So right after he shared a toy with his friend, Joseph's dad gave him attention by telling him how well he was sharing. This seemed to be working for a while. Then Joseph grabbed one of the blocks from his friend. At that point, his dad got up and gave him attention by telling him why he should share with his friend. So let's examine the variables of reinforcer effectiveness in this scenario. First, what was the reinforcer that dad used? Yes, sharing his toys with his friend. Okay. Let's go through the variables of reinforcer effectiveness. Disc. reinforcer effectiveness. Disc. Deprivation. Was Joseph getting a lot of attention at the time? No, his deprivation level for dad's attention was high at the time. Immediacy. Did dad reinforce soon after the behavior? Yes. Size. Did he give enough attention? It seems so, since the behavior initially increased. If the behavior didn't increase, Dad could try to increase the duration of his attention. Contingency. Did Joseph only get attention for sharing? No. He also got attention for grabbing. This told Joseph that he could get attention for both behaviors. Joseph will most likely choose to grab, since that will get him attention and a tangible reinforcer. Let's do another one. Ben and his dad went fishing the first Saturday of every month. They would usually catch fish every 25 casts or so, which was about every 30 minutes. They would usually stay until they had each caught three good-sized fish. This usually took half the day. This Saturday, Ben's dad decided to take him to the lake next to a fish hatchery so that Ben could catch more fish. Ben and his dad caught a good-sized fish on almost every cast. Each cast took less than two minutes. Ben caught a dozen fish in less than a half an hour and then wanted to go home. Ben's dad was disappointed that the fishing trip was cut short. What variable of reinforcer effectiveness was not in place and may have influenced Ben wanting to leave early? Let's look at disc. Deprivation. Were Ben and his dad deprived of catching fish on this Saturday? You might say they were when they first arrived. But after the ninth or tenth fish, the value of catching fish decreased since they had plenty of fish to take home. Immediacy. Did they catch fish soon after they cast the line? Yes. Within two minutes. Size. Were the sizes of the fish worthwhile? Yes. All of the fish they caught were a good size. Contingency. Did they catch fish only by casting? Yes. So the variable that was not in place was deprivation. Most likely Ben's dad will not take him fishing there again. Now let's look at the schedule of the Ben 
Lens and his dad's trip was disrupted by a continuous schedule of reinforcement. A schedule of reinforcement specifies how often particular behavior is followed by a reinforcer. In the case of this fishing trip, Ben was reinforced with a fish for every cast. Continuous schedules of reinforcement are used most often when a new skill is being learned. After the behavior has been acquired, the reinforcement schedule moves to an intermittent schedule of reinforcement. An intermittent schedule of reinforcement is when a behavior is reinforced some of the time. Intermittent schedules of reinforcement have many perks. If Ben caught a fish only every four or five times he cast the line, his rate of casting the line would have been more steady and he would have cast more often as a result. Intermittent schedules generate high response rates. When Ben didn't catch a fish, he was more likely to try again as long as he was able to catch a fish once in a while. Intermittent schedules of reinforcement prevent the behavior from stopping, even if the behavior doesn't produce reinforcement some of the time. There are different types of intermittent schedules of reinforcement. Ratio schedules are based on counting. They count the number of responses that have occurred since the last reinforcement. A fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement is a schedule of reinforcement after a fixed number of responses. For example, George worked as a technician making machines. He was paid using a piece rate system sometimes used in factories. Each day he was paid according to how many machines he was able to assemble. If he were paid $20 for every three machines assembled, we would say that he had a fixed ratio of three or FR3. If George is paid on every three machines made, he is not likely to stop at two. He will most likely work at a steady pace until he has made three, and then he might take a break. Fixed ratio schedules produce high rates of behavior, but there is usually a pause after reinforcement. In a variable ratio, or BR schedule, an average number of responses must be made before the reinforcer is delivered. The best example of variable ratio schedules of reinforcement is a slot machine. A slot machine only provides reinforcement some of the time, usually at a very high rate. The person using the slot machine doesn't know when the reinforcement will be delivered. People are motivated to use slot machines because they never know if their response will be reinforced, and the reinforcement is usually very big. Variable ratio schedules, or VR schedules of reinforcement, are most often used in educational settings because variable ratio schedules produce high rates of responding without a pause. In teaching a child to respond, you may reinforce on a VR 10 schedule of reinforcement during work time. Sometimes you may give a reinforcer on the 8th correct response, sometimes on the 12th correct response, but the average of the responses made before reinforcement is delivered equals 10. It's important to choose a schedule that is providing enough reinforcement to keep the child motivated, but not too much so that the reinforcers lose their value. Interval schedules are based on a passage of time. This is Jack. He runs away from his teachers whenever he is walking around his school. If his teachers reinforce him every three seconds that he is walking next to them, this would be a fixed interval schedule. In fixed interval schedules, it doesn't matter how many times the behavior occurred, the person only gets the reinforcer once the response is given after a fixed amount of time. So in Jack's example, after three seconds elapse, he's reinforced as soon as he performs the target response. In this case, walks next to the teachers. Another way to use interval schedules of reinforcement is to use a variable interval schedule. The reinforcer is delivered for the first response that occurs after a variable amount of time. The person performing the behavior doesn't know when an occurrence of the behavior will contact reinforcement. One example of variable interval schedules is when a person calls a radio station to request a song. If the line is busy and the caller keeps redialing, only the instance after the line has cleared will be reinforced. The number of responses does not influence the availability of reinforcement. Now we're going to get to extinction procedure. Now is extinction used to increase or decrease behavior? We have discussed the behavior enhancement procedures of 
positive and negative reinforcement, the variables of reinforcer effectiveness, and schedules of reinforcement. We will now discuss behavior reduction procedures of extinction, positive punishment, and negative punishment. Terry had been online dating Cynthia for two months now. She responded to all of his emails right away. He asked to meet her in the park on Saturday. She agreed. He waited for an hour and she didn't show up. He emailed her that night and she didn't respond to any of his emails. He tried every day for the next week. After a week of no emails, Terry stopped emailing <laughs> Cynthia. This is an example of extinction. The behavior of emailing Cynthia decreased and was terminated after the reinforcement that had previously been there was discontinued. Intentional or not, Cynthia used a very effective way to decrease behavior by removing the reinforcement that maintained it in the first place. When the response no longer produces reinforcement, this is called extinction. This phenomenon makes it unlikely that the behavior will reoccur in the future. Terry will no longer email Cynthia unless he receives replies from Cynthia. Poor Terry. One characteristic of the extinction procedure is that when a behavior is no longer reinforced, the behavior will briefly increase in frequency, intensity, or duration before it decreases. This is usually an attempt on the part of the individual seeking the reinforcer to see if the behavior will still produce reinforcement if done more intensely or more frequently. This is called an extinction burst. We all have experienced some form of extinction. Have you ever put money in a soda machine and nothing came out? You are at first a little irked, so you start pushing the button again. Extinction bursts bring about variability in responding. So when there is still no soda coming out, then you kick the machine, push it, yell expletives at it, shake it, and to no avail. Finally, you stop interacting with the machine because your behaviors have not been effective in getting that soda out of the machine anyway. Children often have extinction bursts when they don't get what they want in response to crying. If they had been reinforced with an item or with avoiding a non-preferred activity in the past for crying, they may try this behavior often to get what they want. If someone doesn't give them the reinforcement they seek, they may increase the intensity frequency, and duration of the crying. It may turn into a full-fledged tantrum. They may also engage in behaviors that they haven't done in the past, such as aggression or throwing items, again illustrating the variability in responding that extinction brings about. These are all characteristics of an extinction burst. Extinction can be a powerful tool to decrease behaviors. Parents typically use extinction to get a child to fall asleep on their own. Young children are used to having mom or dad come when they cry in their bed, and so when a child is ready to fall asleep on their own, a parent may need to use extinction to decrease crying in bed. Some parents call this crying it out. When parents put the child down initially, the child will cry as he always has. But when the behavior of crying doesn't contact the reinforcer, the child will cry longer and harder. This is tempting for a worried parent to go in and provide comfort to the child. But if the parent were to do that, the more intense crying behavior will be reinforced and the child will learn, I just need to cry harder and longer to get what I want. This makes the behavior more resistant to extinction or more difficult to decrease or reduce the behavior. Claire used to get stickers on her chart for picking up her toys. She had been doing very well and mom decided that Claire didn't need stickers anymore. Claire's mom used extinction by not reinforcing a previously reinforced behavior. Taking reinforcement away too abruptly may actually cause the behavior to stop. How could have Claire's mom avoided this? Claire's mom could have used intermittent schedules of reinforcement to maintain the behavior. Remember the schedules of reinforcement? What type of reinforcement schedule would have resisted extinction and kept Claire's behavior or picking up her toys at a high rate? 
It is the variable ratio schedule of reinforcement that is most resistant to exclusion. Y'all do that, right? Everyone do that? Do you remember why? Because the learner is less likely to give up when he does what? You don't know exactly when you're going to, you know, get your reinforcer. You're gonna just continue to perform at that high steady rate because maybe this next time. Remember, this is the example like with the slot machine. You sit there for hours and hours because maybe this next time you'll win the car or you know whatever it is you're you're planning for. Not know when he will be reinforced. It is like going to Vegas and pulling the slot machine. <laughs> don't know when you're going to get the three cherries. This makes you think, maybe the next one will be it, thus keeping you at the same machine. Let's go back to Terry to help us demonstrate our next concept, related to extinction. So it had been weeks since he last emailed Cynthia. He had started looking around for other fish in the sea. When he saw Cynthia's name on his list of contacts, this served as an antecedent, or SD, and he started emailing Cynthia again. What is that called? Stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> it's a behavioral term. <laughs> what is it called? What is it called when a behavior, once it has been put on extinction, okay. naturally comes out again? Now, what happens if Cynthia responds back. It reinforces back again. So then now what has happened to that behavior? It comes to, it can increase because now it's been put on what type of schedule of reinforcement? Variable ratio. Variable ratio. <laughs> this phenomenon is called spontaneous recovery. Spontaneous recovery sometimes occurs with extinction procedures. Even though the behavior has not been reinforced in a long time, it may occur again with the same frequency and intensity <laughs> as it once did when it was being reinforced. If extinction continues to remain in place when this occurs, the behavior will go away again. So if Cynthia doesn't respond to his emails, he will most likely stop trying again. Poor Terry. <laughs> Oh, he had a wedding ring. Yeah. I think that was probably <laughs> yes. Oh, he's turning your girl on the side. I, Another behavior reduction strategy is punishment. The word punishment used in APA is different than what most of society thinks of punishment. When people think of punishment, they think of fines, thankies, scoldings, or death sentences. These are very negative things to associate to a behavior reduction procedure. The punishment we are talking about is a technical term with a specific meaning. Punishment is an event that occurs after a behavior that decreases that behavior. Punishment can be as subtle as a look given to a person or simply asking someone to not do that again. It's anything that happens after the behavior that makes it less likely for that behavior to happen again. If we go back to our table, we can recall that positive, in this case, means something was added. When positive punishment is used, an aversive event is added following a behavior, and as a result, decreases that behavior. For example, Sam liked to tell dirty jokes. His friend Samantha didn't appreciate them. She usually wouldn't say anything to him. She would just roll her eyes while others laughed one day, Samantha had enough. When Stan told a dirty joke that offended her, she asked him to stop telling those jokes. Stan stopped telling dirty jokes. Was that punishment? Let's put it to the test. What behavior decreased?
positive punishment because something was added after a behavior that decreased that behavior. Negative punishment is removing a stimulus after the behavior and thus decreasing that behavior. Some negative punishment procedures that are commonly used are timeout from positive reinforcement and response cost. Positive punishment occurs when one adds something, and negative punishment occurs when one takes away something. For example, mom might take away her son's privilege <laughs> of using the family car because he broke curfew. This is an example of response cost. His behavior cost him something. Response cost is used quite often in classrooms, care programs, and in homes as a consequence for unwanted behaviors. Another common type of negative punishment is timeout from positive reinforcement, or just timeout. Timeout is defined as the withdrawal of the opportunity to earn positive reinforcement or the loss of access to positive reinforcement for a specific period of time. For example, Kylie loves to play soccer with her friends. One day, her brother Sam kept stealing the ball from her during a game. She got angry and pushed him. When the teacher saw this, he made sure Sam was okay and then pulled Kylie out of the game for five minutes. This is one way to use the timeout procedure. Kylie didn't get a chance to play, and the teacher did not provide any intention or other reinforcers. When the time was up, the teacher gave time in back to Kylie. The next time Kylie's brother stole the ball, she didn't push him. Her aggressive behavior decreased as a result. Time out is effective only when time in is valuable to the person, and that there is no reinforcement during time out. Zach likes to draw. During math instruction, Zach started drawing in his math book. The teacher caught him doodling in his math book and gave him a detention slip. In detention, Zach doodles the whole time. To the teacher's surprise, Zach continued to doodle in his math book in class. Why didn't timeout work in this instance? Was timeout serving as punishment for his behavior? Why? So what the teacher would do? Positive reinforcement. Yes. So it's positive. It's reinforcement because the behavior increased, didn't decrease. So that's for sure. And it's positive because what? Because the person was added. Yeah. Something was added after he was said to. Did that kind of help a little bit to actually see videos and to see the slides and the different stuff? Yes. Um, I want to see the chart. The chart? Yeah. The, uh, well, you know, I actually, I think I had told, didn't I give you guys a chart?
going to be looking now not after behavior, so not what happens after behavior, but we want to know what is happening right before the behavior occurs. And, the, and this is called antecedent, the antecedent. So this is a stimulus event that precedes an operant response. So it comes before the behavior. Okay? And this is what we call the ABCs of operant behavior. So it's antecedent, behavior, and consequence. Let me just kind of Okay, so the ABC. So the behavior, this is the operant behavior, right? This is what we can actually see. Okay. And then the consequence is what we've been talking about as far as reinforcers, punishers, and then whether that procedure is, you know, reinforcement or punishment, so whether it's increasing or decreasing behavior. So today what we're going to look at is the antecedent. So in what situation is the behavior more or less likely to occur? Okay? So antecedents don't necessarily cause a behavior to occur, but they just increase the likelihood that a behavior either will or will not occur. And so we're going to be looking at Okay, so the first thing, we have to put that antecedent under stimulus control. So stimulus control basically just means that the behavior is going to be more likely to occur when a specific antecedent, so some type of stimulus, when some type of stimulus is present, then that is more likely that a specific behavior will, will occur. So for example, um, on page 125, on page 125, there's a whole bunch of different examples of stimulus control. So number one, it says, a man says, I love you to his wife, but not any of the people where he works. So only when his wife is present, so wife being present, that's the antecedent. Only when wife is present does he say, I love you. And as a consequence, she says it back to him. So as a consequence, right, she says, oh, I love you too. Which then is going to keep that, that behavior is going to increase in the future, right? That's reinforcing him. So he says, I love you. She says, I love you too. That behavior of saying, I love you, is going to increase, okay? So positive reinforcement. But it's only when the wife is present. So that is stimulus control. Because if he's at work and it's a coworker, the behavior of saying, I love you, Obviously, it's not going to get reinforced, right? Well, hopefully it doesn't. I mean, no one else is going to say, oh, I love you too, at work, right? <laughs> but hopefully not. So that, that's what I mean here. And here are some other examples, just so we kind of get more practice. For example, another one would be when you're driving, okay, and... Um, the stoplight is red, okay? Only when the stoplight is red are you going to what? Stop, right? Just legally, right? You're supposed to stop. And when it's green, you're going to go. You're going to press the accelerator, okay? So when the light is green, only when the light is green, are you going to press the accelerator, and as a consequence, then not, you know, you're going to get to your destination, wherever it is that you're going. 
if the light was red, are you going to press the accelerator? No. You're not supposed to. Okay. <laughs> so this is what we mean by stimulus control. Only when a specific antecedent is present is the behavior more likely to occur to get reinforced. Okay? So only when the light is green are you going to press the accelerator. And only when the light is red are you going to press the brake pedal. And then there's some other examples here. Okay? Okay. So that is stimulus control. So let's practice. Now, here's an example. Whenever Jake wants some extra cash to spend, he asks his mom. She usually gives him his, some money. When he asks his dad, his dad usually refuses to give him any money and tells him to get a job. As a result, he usually asks his mom for money instead of his dad. So let's look at let's look at the ABCs. So what is the behavior? What's the operant behavior? Let's look at that first. Let's see what we Asking for money. Okay, so the behavior is asking for money. Now, what is the antecedent? In what situation is he more likely? Mom is present. So, mom present, he's going to ask for money, and what's the consequence? He gets money. He gets money. Okay? So even if I were to put something like that, okay, put a little example, would you be able to identify the ABCs, the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence? So I always say start with the behavior. That's usually the easiest, right? What's the operant behavior? Asking for money. When he, the behavior of asking for money is only more likely to happen when mom is present. And when mom is present and he asks for money, he gets money. You see how I kind of broke that down? <coughs> so that should help you guys. Okay, so now... Okay. How do we develop stimulus control? How do we teach that? How do we get that to occur? Well, first of all, we need to create what's called a discriminative stimulus. So in short, we, just, we call that an SD. Okay? S and then the little D on the top. I just put the D on the top. They're supposed to have a little D on the top, you know, right? So with the discriminative stimulus, that means that whenever that antecedent is present, the behavior is going to get reinforced. So this example that I just that we just did right now with asking money. Who in this example would be considered the SD? The mother. Because remember, the mother is the antecedent, right? She's the antecedent. So when she's present, he's going to ask for money. And when he asks for money, he gets reinforced. So by definition, she now is the SD for asking for money. Now, when you are training someone, training someone's behavior to be under some type of stimulus control, you must, one, yes, present the SD. So some, some entity, it must be present so that way the behavior can occur so they can get reinforced. But also, when any other antecedent is present, they are not going to get reinforced, okay? Which is what we call the S delta. The S delta is when a specific antecedent is present, a behavior occurs, and they don't get reinforced. So in the example 
people that we just talked about with asking for money, who was considered the S delta? The father. Because remember, so now, okay, so dad's present. Dad is present. The likelihood now that Jake will ask for money, yeah, is he going to do it? No. No. Why? Because the dad's very helpful. But, but why? Because in the past, when he's asked dad for money, what is Dad doesn't give it to him. Dad does not reinforce that behavior. So dad has become the S delta. Yeah, yeah S delta basically is just when a specific antecedent is present and the behavior does not get reinforced. Okay? So now, how do we, you know, how do we practice this um, training in the lab? It's actually, it's really fun to do. But uh, Pollen and Skinner first conducted uh, these applications in the lab using pigeons, and I'm sure uh, most of you all read the chapter, so you read all about it. But basically, what they did is they uh, had these cages and. So they had, they put the pigeons in these cages, and each cage had a key. Okay, each cage had a key, a little di round disc. So first they trained the pigeons to peck the disc, and once they pecked the disc, they uh, received food immediately. Okay. So every time now the pigeon knows when I press this key, I'm going to get food. Okay? So I just check the key to get food. All right. Now when they train them to be able to discriminate the likelihood that food is available, they use two different, they presented two different uh, lights. And so they had a red light and they had a green light, okay? okay? Now, when you're trying to teach discrimination, when you're, when you're um, using discrimination training, what they chose was that only when the red light was on and the pigeon pecked the key, the pigeon was going to get reinforced with food. Okay? Only when the red light was on. Occasionally, they would turn off the red light, and they would turn on the green light. When the green light was on, and the pigeon pecked the key, the pigeon did not get reinforced. Okay, so the red key was what? Considered the key. So the red, during, when the red light was on, the pigeon got reinforced. So that would be considered what? The discriminative stimulus. And when the green light was on, the green light would be what? The S delta. So it did not, he did not get reinforced. Okay. So what they found was that when the red light was on, the likelihood that the pigeon pecked the key actually was more frequent than when the green light was on. When the green light was on, the pigeon just kind of walked around in the cage. It is hardly tech the key. So that is how they found, oh wow, okay, so you know now how can we use this with, with humans? And and I'll show you how we use this um, in, in the real world. But anyway, that's how you can practice it. And we've done it here at the behavioral lab too with the with the rats, same thing basically. Uh, we had in the skinner boxes, instead of a red light or a green light, it's just one light. But what we did was basically just when the light was on, they would peck, they would press the lever and then they would get the food. And when the light was off, we didn't give them any food, and so they just learned that as soon as the light turned on, there they would go and they would push, you know, press the lever and then they would get reinforced. As soon as we put the 
light off, then they would just go on the other side of the page because they knew that they could they could check a hundred times and they're not going to get the answer. Okay. So remember, discrimination training is just we're looking at the antecedents and how those antecedents will make a behavior more or less likely to occur. Not causing the behavior to occur, I want to make that clear. Just the likelihood, okay? Do they increase or decrease? So, how do we apply this um, to humans? And one way, and it's talked about in your book, is with reading. When it, only when you see the letters, for example, C A T, what does that say? What does that spell? If you were to see the letter D O G, would you say cat? No. So your behavior of your response cat is under it's under an S D, and the S D are the letters C A T. Only when you see those letters, you're gonna say cat, which is your response, and. As a consequence, well, probably when you were at school and you read that, right? Well, what does that say, cat? Awesome, good job, you're such a good reader, right? You got reinforced. And so because of that, that behavior then is going to increase, okay? Also, um, what else? Letters, yeah, so anyway, does that make sense? Discrimination training can also be used with punishment. So not only when a certain antecedent is present and we get reinforced, does that become an SD, but it can also be an SD for a punisher. For example, uh, I think I gave you all an example of the boiling hot soup, right? And then you taste it and then you burn your mouth, and so that's a punisher, right? Well, so now the boiling soup, I don't know what's like to me, right? When, so now the boiling soup has become what? The SD for what? What's the behavior? Taking a, yeah, eating the soup, right? So actually, when the soup is boiling, you're not going to taste the soup because you were punished last time when the soup was boiling, okay? So only when the soup is boiling is your behavior going to now decrease, but if the soup is not boiling, then it's going to increase, right? Then yeah, you'll, sure, you can eat spoonfuls of it. Okay, so that's all this is saying is that with discrimination training, it's not just with behaviors that get reinforced, but also with behaviors that are punished as well. Okay? And then, this is just kind of what, I've, what I talked about at the beginning as far as the ABCs of behavior. So the antecedent stimulus, is that before or after the behavior occurs? Before. Before. And what comes after the behavior? Consequence. The consequence. And which one causes the behavior to occur again? The consequence. Yes. Consequence is what causes the behavior to occur again or you know to increase or decrease. And then which one increases or decreases the likelihood that the behavior will occur? The antecedent. Yeah. I know I'm probably repeating a lot of things, but that's it's good. It'll sink in. Okay? Alright. Okay, so now, generalization. When we're talking about generalization,
information. And we got, we saw this term at the beginning of the semester when you all read that article uh, with the seven dimensions of APA, and one of them was generalization. Okay, with generalization, all this means is that when the behavior that has been taught, whether it's um, at school or at a, let's say it's at a, uh, a clinic. Okay? When the behavior that has been taught at the clinic can also occur at home, at school, out in the community, wherever, at a restaurant, then we can say that generalization has occurred. And with any program that that we write, any, any ABA program, we always keep in mind and we always use procedures where generalization is more likely to occur. Because what benefit is it for, for a seven-year-old to be able to read, um, to be able to read anything, right? Only in a clinic, but when he goes out in school or goes to the restroom, he's not able to read. That's not functional, okay? So that is one thing that uh, that you, you have to do, that you, can, you must do. And so here's, did I talk about this? Okay. <laughs> Skinner talked about something called a generalization gradient. And all that means is that when other stimuli are less, how do you say, less similar to the SD, then the behavior is less likely to occur. For example, the, the pigeon study that Holland and Skinner did with discrimination training. When they showed the red light, the availability of food was there. When they showed the green light, it wasn't. Okay. Generalization gradient basically just means that, okay, so when the red light is on, food is available. If the light was maybe a pinkish color, so, you know, it kind of looked like a red, the behavior probably still will occur. Once it starts fading out and looking like a different color, once it looks less similar to the SD, which was the red color, once it starts looking less similar, then the behavior is less likely to occur. When you think about it, yeah, that makes sense, right? Well, okay, if I know that only when the light is red, food is available, I'm going to press that key. Even if it kind of looks like red, if it starts turning a little pink, yeah, let me push it, right? Yeah, I might get reinforced. Once it starts turning yellow or blue, oh, well, no, that's not red, so I'm not going to do it. Okay, so there's this gradient that will occur that will also increase or decrease the likelihood that the behavior will happen again. Okay? So an example of generalization, and so one is uh, if you're if you're teaching a, a child maybe to read, to read, and let's say one of the words was uh, men, and this is in your book, men, right? To read when they see the letters M E N, they say the word men, they get reinforced in in the clinic, right? Ooh, you can say it, you can read it. When general when generalization occurs, this is when, let's say, now he is at a restaurant, right? He's with his family, they're eating, he has to go to the restroom, he walks in the area where the restroom is. When he is able now to look at the doors and read men on the, on the men's bathroom door, that is when generalization occurs. Because now, not only is he able to read those letters in the clinic, but he's able to read them out in a restaurant. And so now, let's say before, since he didn't know how to read, he was always walking into the girl's bathroom. Because he didn't know, he couldn't read. Okay? So with generalization, 
all right, now he's at, at a restaurant, he's able to read the letters. At Walmart now, he's able to go to the bathroom, he can read. At school, he's able to read the letters. Okay? So that is why generalization is so important. That way, hey, mom and dad don't have to go with him to make sure he goes into the right door because he can read and he can go by himself. We want to create that as much independence, you know, as, as we can. Okay? And then the next term, stimulus. When you have more than one antecedent that share similar features, you can call this a stimulus class, for example. If you ask your son, let's say his name's Johnny, Johnny, go clean up the table. Okay? So you ask him to do something. You're placing a demand. That's the antecedent, right? Placing a demand on Johnny. Now, to form a stimulus class would be to ask him to do different things. So not just cleaning the table, and then he responds, and he goes, and he picks up the plates, and then he puts them in the kitchen. But then also to ask him, uh, Johnny, can you go clean your room? Or go clean your room. Let's see. So another antecedent that share similar features, meaning they're all asking him to do something. Asking him to do something. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it shares some common feature, which is asking, placing a demand on him, right? And have the same functional effect on a particular behavior. So getting him to do, getting him to comply, getting him to, when you ask him to pick up the, the table, he takes the dishes and he puts them in the sink. When you ask him to clean his room, he's going to pick up his toys and put them away. Okay? So as long as they share similar features, they can all be a part of this stimulus class. The stimulus class is kind of like a general term for different antecedents. So for example, let's look at this one and see if we can identify the preterm contingency. So four-year-old Millie is a girl with severe mental retardation who exhibits SID. SID is self-injurious behavior, which means, you know, she either hits herself or bangs her head or any, any uh, act that harms you know, her body. Specifically, when her mother is in the room. Okay, so four-year-old Millie is a girl with severe mental retardation who exhibits SID. Specifically, when her mom is in the room, she gets down on her hands and knees and bangs her head on the floor. When Millie bangs her head, her mom goes to her and stops her from engaging in the behavior by holding her and talking to her. So let's break this down and let's identify the ABCs. First of all, what's the behavior? Let's always start with that one. Okay. So banging head on floor. And then what is the 